my name is Brian Poulin. Uh, I'm the uh, editor of View magazine. There's some copies here. It's a social affairs magazine. Um, and I'm also the co-founder of View Digital, which is a, an organization made up of journalists. And we do uh, a range of magazines. In fact, this year, we're now working on our 60th issue. So we've been going 10 years now. And what we do basically is that we pick a theme for the magazine. And then that theme looks in depth at that subject. So over the years, we've looked at homelessness, housing, health, suicide prevention, domestic abuse. Uh, and this issue, which you have in your hands, which are on the seats there, um, looked at the stories concerning the deaf community. Today on the panel, and I'm delighted that they're here, we have Patricia Donald from Advice NI. We have Aidan Campbell from Rural Community Network. And we have... Um, uh, Richard Doherty, uh, architect, and also the chair of Action Death Youth. Uh, and we also have D Donna McGlinchey here, who's signing for this event. Anyway, I'm just going to start off with a few, a few general questions, because the name of this event is Digital Inclusion. And I kind of want to get the panel's idea on what does that mean to them. Um, I'll, I'll start off with, um, with Aidan. Aidan, if I say to you Digital Inclusion, what does that mean? Um, digital inclusion to me, I suppose, means that ensuring that people, anyone who wants to get online and have access to digital services or, um, you know, just to interact with people online has the means, first of all, that the infrastructure is there to do it. Um, that's really important for us in rural communities for, because for a long time and still in a lot of areas, um, we don't have the broadband or mobile phone connectivity. Uh, believe it or not, in the, in the 21st century, there's still lots of communities um, and lots of households where people can't get online, don't have a decent broadband speed. Um, so f the first thing that we would be saying would, you know, or when you say digital inclusion to me from a rural point of view, is just having the physical infrastructure there, the capability to actually do it if you want to, you know, if you want to get online. Um, in terms of Digital exclusion, we maybe talk about that a, a bit down the line and I'll maybe pass over to Patricia or Richard. Uh, Richard, digital inclusion, what does that mean for you? <clears throat> well, funny enough, when I arrived here today, um, I came into the digital inclusion event and the first thing I came in the door, I was already hitting the buyer with the masks. I had no clue what people were saying, so that was even ironic just when I come to Digital and please, and the first thing I come in is a buyer with a mask. But interesting you're asking me here. Um, really, I mean, digital area has really, really changed my life, that whole dis digital area. I mean, I was born in 1970, so right up to about 1980s, I was, you know, hitting a lot of barriers, for example, at university, you know, filling in, in my UCLan form, you know, um, this, that, and the other, and the teachers, and, and, you know, I couldn't hear properly, but, you know, you know, I was wanting architecture, you know, so I was able to do drawing and the language, and that was before even the internet was even here. So now, I mean, I am so lucky because, you know, I don't use the phone anymore. You know, I have to be, be an email, FaceTime, Facebook, all of that there is involved now in my life. But I do remember <clears throat> over 50% statistics are non-users of, yeah, non-users are over 50% are disabled people. That's what the statistics are saying. So why is that happening? You know, maybe it's because, you know, for me and my own experience, um, you know, especially in the deaf community, they struggle with English. You know, English is not their first language. You know, the jargon there, the English, the context, all of that there. You know, the content and all of that there. And all of that's online and you're thinking, what does this mean? And they have to navigate their way through all this. You know, it's like, for example, car insurance. For example, I had a problem recently. I was filling in all my car insurance online, you know, filling all the details in. And at the very end, they asked me, oh, can you phone and confirm this? I thought, phone? I really struggle to write it all down, and now I have to phone you, so I have to ask my sister or my, my you know, her husband or whatever to ring for me. And that takes away my identity, it takes away my confidence that I cannot complete that on my own, that I have to be an indep not independent for myself. So that's part of my digital inclusion, what I mean. Thank you very much, Richard. And Patricia, last but not least. Um, inclusion, exclusion, whichever you want to term it. 
I suppose for us in Advice NI, our, our vision statement is about active, informed, confident citizens who can access their rights and entitlements. And accessing your rights and entitlements as everything becomes digital first or digital only is becoming more and more difficult. And we support digital, absolutely. But for everyone, bring everyone with you. And unfortunately, there are people who can't access and ironically, those are the very people whose lives could be improved if they could access. And I'll give you a quick example of that. Um, Northern Ireland has the highest rates or the highest level of personal debt per person, excluding mortgages. The average per head of debt in Northern Ireland is just under £4,000. <coughs> and we know that if you can go online, you can save, I think the average is £700 a year. You can get better deals. You can manage your money better if you can do online banking. So the very people that are being excluded and that need support and could improve access services to help improve their lives are the people that we're leaving behind. Thank you, Patricia. Um, I know as a, I have broadband at home and I know when I, um, when I got it uh, established, I'm not sure who the provider is now. Um, I think it was around about 30 pound to get me into broadband. And now, for generally the same service, I pay £76. So the cost has went up, but I'm generally getting this, the same service. Is the financial, the financial cost of, of, of the internet, does that impact upon communities? Um, Aidan? Yeah, I would say it does. I mean, I was chatting earlier about the, just the, in rural communities, about the, the basic infrastructure, the existence of, of broadband signal and mobile phone signal. And that's, and, you know, if that doesn't exist in the community, if that connectivity is not there, then, you know, everyone in that area is going to struggle to get online in that particular area. And now, people who have the resources obviously can access through work in their place of work or um, can buy in satellite broadband or whatever. I mean, it's part of the reason why um, Project Stratum, um, that was, you know, however many mi million was put in by the UK government, um, to improve rural broadband, and it is targeted at 76,000 households. But I guess that's only one part of it. I mean, if you can't, the next part is, you know, well, how, can I afford a device? So have I got a mobile phone, a laptop, whatever, that's gonna get me online? So that's the second factor. Then can you afford data? Can you get a plan that you can afford, that you can keep going with? I mean, most my kids are, um, well, this is m my own fault in terms of trying to curtail them, or they're on a pay-as-you-go, um, Tesco plan on their wee mobile phones, but you know I do that deliberately so they do run out of data. But there's lots of people in 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 households where income is tight, where that is you know their data runs out long before the end of the month, um, and that's them offline until it renews. And I suppose the final thing then I'd say is the importance of skills and confidence. So in some households there may be the material means they may have be able to afford a device, be able to afford a data plan have connectivity in their area, but they don't have the skills or the confidence or they're maybe afraid of getting online, especially older people um, who maybe have, are hearing um, stuff in the media all the time about digital scams and are, are, are worried about getting conned. Um, so those are, to me, some of the factors in terms of, of people who, who can get online. I mean, if I think about my own household, um, we had broadband from BT, which was terrible. Uh, we had that for years. We then had a, th a, a, a sort of mobile broadband through a, a, wife, a, a SIM card, uh, which was about £25 a month. We, our area was one of the first to get Project Stratum in May. It's £55 a month. So that's okay in our house. We have two people working. For lots of households, £55 a month. There's a lot of you know, calls on that £55 before you go into broadband. Thank you very much, Aidan. Uh, Patricia, in terms of people coming in to advice NI for help, when it comes to the broadband, the internet, etc., what sort of issues do you, d do you deal with? Well, again, it would be affordability, and we're about to hit the perfect storm um, in terms of affordability. If we think that people are starting to come off furloughs, furlough ends, and may not have jobs to go back to, um, universal credit, which people in low incomes depend on, are about to lose their £20 a week uplift. So that doesn't leave, also prices are going up with the whole lorry driver issue, so that doesn't leave a lot of money for data. 
Um, and I think a new term that we hear people talking about now um, across the UK since COVID is the issue of data poverty. And in Advice NI, we would absolutely um, ask that data is treated like a utility bill um, and given the same, um, I don't know what the word is, uh, the same thoughts around it. If, if you're in crisis and it's winter, the electricity companies, the utility companies can't just switch people off. Um, there's a whole lot of uh, protocols there they have to go through. And I think data should be treated in the same way. And I would also say there are people um, in our communities who, and I'm thinking particularly people who are seeking asylum and are housed in home office accommodation and are living on, uh, I think it's 37 pounds 70 a week, which doesn't even allow you to buy the necessary food. So how you can afford a device or data out of that. And a lot of um, our asylum seeking communities really do depend on their phones and the data that they have on their phones to stay in contact with families who may d be dispersed across the world because of the situation they find themselves in. Thank you, Patricia. And uh, Richard, um, in terms of um, the deaf community and in terms of cost, financial cost, what sort of impact does that have? I would say it's probably very similar to what Aidan and Patricia have said. Um, you know, I don't feel that, you know, it's good value for money, you know. Then you have to like, buy your broadband and, you know, we can access it full 100% anyway. For example, you know, online, you know, videos were blocked because, you know, there's no captions there, you know. So we can't even see what they're saying. And so a big businesses, you know, who have captions with the videos. But Facebook, for example, I think there's over 8 billion users who watch Facebook per day. That's what they're saying. You know, over 80% of those are watching videos without sound. So, if you think about that, you know, the captions, you know, we, I don't understand. For example, for businesses, they're saying, you know, they're so expensive to put captions on, they're time consuming, and I'm saying, hold on here, you know, you know, voice recognition software, and it can automatically put it into captions nowadays. Think about making their businesses more accessible for everyone, rather than, you know, you know, and maybe broadband, bring the broadband down cheaper, bring the companies, bring the broadband down cheaper so more people can access that. So that's all my feelings about the deaf community for accessibility. Thank you very much, Richard. I'd just like to move on now to um, a question for all three of you, and you can, you can answer it in turn is um, if one big thing was to happen in terms of digital inclusion, one big thing that would make that change and you'd want it to, it to become policy, what would that look like? Start with you, Patricia. I think for me it would be the connection to the internet, which is data and devices and the affordability around that and people's right, people's right to be connected to the internet because we know it has so many positive outcomes, whether it be health outcomes, educational outcomes, um, access and services that can improve your life. And I think skills is an issue, but I think you need to get online and then you can get the skills. Once you get online, th there's, there's loads of people um, and loads of places where you can access the skills. For example, we, we have a great community partnership going with uh, at the minute during COVID with PwC, where um, some of their staff have been given up uh, an hour of their lunchtime and they're upskilling people in, in our sector, the voluntary community sector, and it's been fantastic. But the assumption there is that everybody's online in the first place. So I, I think it's, for me, it's about affordability and the access to device and data. Well, one of the things I suppose I would be going back to was, uh, and he's in the news again this week, is uh, Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour, the previous Labour governments, uh, or Labour government, sorry, that's wishful thinking maybe on my part, but Labour Party, the, before the, the previous election, talking about nationalising broadband. 
um, because from a rural point of view, it may as well be nationalised anyway because none of the companies will come into rural areas unless they have um, substantial public subsidy. Um, so at a Westminster level, I think there's a need to look at you know, the investment that the state has put into broadband and into telecommunications networks over decades now um, and who gets the benefit of that. Um, at an assembly level, at a Northern Ireland level, I guess the thing that, that we would probably be advocating now is that we look more at, a look at this issue with a digital inclusion lens um, because I think for the last 20 years we've looked at it from an infrastructure, um, we've looked at the, the, the problem's been framed and you know, if we could just get it out into rural communities if, and in urban areas, if we could just invest more to make the networks go faster, provide people with better speeds, build fiber out, you know, I remember, still remember ADSL and, and all these, you know, when you, when you tried to click in all these, we clicks and words, I'm of that, that generation. I also grew up in a house where there was no landline telephone until I was about 18, so that shows my vintage. But I think if the assembly would start to approach it now, we, we've made significant progress, I think, in terms of the provision of infrastructure and hopefully Project Stratum, although it won't sort all rural rural householders out, it's not a 100% solution. It will sort out a significant number um, with fibre to the premises. I think we need to look now at that digital inclusion lens. First of all, to quantify it, I don't think we have a proper handle on who exactly is excluded and for what reason. And then to work with community and voluntary organisations to, to build the skills, to build the confidence, to get people online, to get the devices out there to the people that need them. And to, you know, to explore, to, to develop the potential that's in you know people in communities, um, and ensure people can you, you know, make the most in lots of rural businesses. You know, I see lots of rural businesses that have great potential to grow, that could do a lot more if they had those connections. And I mean, you know, as we move, you know, we're coming up to COP26 in a few weeks' time. We want to try and re like we're trying to reduce carbon here. Hopefully, we'll have a climate change act by this time next year. Um, and we'll try and reduce some of this commuting, promote home working, um, and build the potential. I mean, you know, we could, we could, put, you know, we're a relatively small region. We could be a world leader on this stuff if we put the money into it. Thank you very much. So you, you've heard it here, a call for nationalisation. That's quite interesting. <laughs> At a digital DNA conference, it, I must admit, I find that quite interesting. Anyway, uh, I'll move over here to uh, Richard. Uh, Richard, in terms of this, one big thing, and a positive thing or something that could happen which would make that big change. I know it's a big topic, but is there something that leaps to your mind about this issue? <clears throat> One thing um, from access point of view is that, you know, I think we all sort of need to properly, you know, do some strategic thinking about this, about digital inclusion. inclusion. What, what I mean by that is, you know, we need to start being more aware of how disabled people can access to different things. I mean, not just them, but the problem is in, you know, architecture and all the things that, you know, you know, try to do refresh training, everything like that, I have to try and access, you know. So trying to advocate for all of those people, digital, and get that involved and get that process moving along. You know, try to empower that, like, you know, so that they don't feel include and excluded that they have access, and that's for everybody. For me, um, for example, you know, through COVID, um, I mean, I have a deaf daughter. Um, now, with COVID now, um, I was working, she was doing homeschooling, she was with me, um, you know, we were using her iPad, and, you know, she was with a teacher and all the rest. But and then all, all my other children um, were able to access, you know, Teams on their computers, you know, and they were able to hear the teacher and be able to listen to the teachers. But my daughter, she had to have the interpreter on screen. But it wasn't very clear. It, was, it depends on the connection. It was very robotic at times. So the access, you know, we tried to try to get that to, to try and balance out with her other friends in the class. They could sit and listen to Teams and they didn't have to rely on the visual part of it. It was for my daughter, she had to rely on the visual. So, you know, so you have to think, you know, we are visual, you know, we are all humans. We all work visually as well and auditory, obviously, for some of us. But to feel, you know, I just felt awful that, you know, those that, you know, yeah, they, they could hear auditory was digital inclusion could possibly change and have that recognized of how we can include and start, 
you know, to have disabled people more involved in the whole process, not having that an afterthought, not having a disabled people being an afterthought of it all. Thank you very much. Is there, in terms of our huge audience here, is there, <laughs> is there anyone here who would like to ask a question? Please feel free to. I can pass the mic to you. Anyone? Do you have any takers? Oh, no legs. I'm just maybe thinking, are there any examples where it's working well? Um, maybe particularly in the deaf community, what services are doing something different that works well and that other people can repeat? Very good. Um, okay, let me think, let me think, let me think. Well, obviously, you know, yeah. So it's all been relatively new to me, all this digital inclusion, all this digital access for me and the information now that I can get through digital. But um, I feel like it's very useful, obviously from my, from my point of view, you know, social media, you have your Facebook, you have your Instagram, you know, they're all very popular and they're accessible to most <clears throat> of the deaf community and most of the deaf groups. Um, so for that point of view, it's been really good. Um, but sorry, that's about all I can think of at the moment. I'm struggling with thinking of anything more. Would, uh, yeah, uh, you're absolutely right. It does show there has to be more. Yeah, I agree with you. Aidan, number three, would you uh, could take that up? Um, not from a deaf community point of view, but for, certainly from a rural community point of view, there's, there are some brilliant examples. I mean, we're in touch with um, community development groups in the Republic of Ireland and the Irish government since the pandemic has now put in you know, lots of investment into um, remote working hubs right across rural Ireland. Um, there's a network of hubs uh, where you, know, you can book in, book a hot desk for a day, book it for a week, book it for a month, depending on where you are. Um, and there's a lot of work and a lot of thinking going into that. Lots of them are located along, you know, close to where <coughs> you know, fiber connections are, are, are passing, you know, for data centers. Um, and there's a concerted plan um, in the Republic of Ireland around ensuring that this idea of home working and trying to take people away from the very long commutes, which like in Northern Ireland, we're a lot more compact, obviously, um, with the development of the economy around Greater Dublin over the last 30 years. You know, commuting got really out of hand where people were doing crazy stuff, like over 100 miles a day, or like 100, maybe 200 miles a day round trip. So the Irish government has taken, a, and we're in touch with, with officials down there that are backing this. They're looking at trying to, they hope to invest about 300 million quid over the next four or five years to try and build this network of remote working hubs um, and those are in urban and rural communities. In rural communities, they're maybe more about that hot desk and stuff. Certainly in urban areas, they're more about high-tech startup, and there's certainly a lot of those, um, the urban ones that are developing specialities around the types of startups. You know, it's, it's naturally evolving, the types of companies that are starting to, to, to form and, and grow out of this. Um, so there's big opportunities there in terms of that economic development, but also in terms of, in terms of climate. Um, reducing carbon, reducing commuting, and improving people's quality of life. I think a lot of us probably have reevaluated maybe work um, and work-life balance since the pandemic came in. Um, and certainly that's a good example that we are seeing that's in progress in the South at the moment. Excellent, thanks very much. Uh, Patricia? I think it's a really good question. Um, and I think, I think the whole issue is very fixable, but I don't think any one organization can fix it I think it's about partnership working and I think there's some fantastic examples of partnership working out there and I think even uh, within my own organization as I mentioned we have um, the partnership with PwC going and I know it's mu mutually working for both of us because we're getting to upskill people's skills level their staff are getting to volunteer and they're building experience of delivering uh, skills and delivering over Zoom, etc. So that's working really well. We're entering into um, partnerships with two banks um, who have given us funding um, for the next year. And we're hoping to get their staff to come 
and talk to um, particularly older people about online banking and uh, safety measures that they can put in place. So again, that's an example of partnership working. I know that some of the telcos are starting to give um, out data and SIM cards. I think Vodafone have just announced recently that they will give SIM cards with six months worth of data on it. I think it's a tiny wee step, but again, with that partnership working, um, I think that's the way to solve it. And I also think um, a good digital inclusion strategy for Northern Ireland, because I think what is, I think England and Scotland, I'm more aware of what the Scottish model has been fantastic. They have, um, it, I think it's called uh, Connect in Scotland. So they really have worked over the last 18 months to connect everybody in Scotland, whether it's devices, data or skills. But they've also helped to upskill the whole voluntary community sector, which I think is a big issue as well. So yeah, for me, it's partnership working. You, you heard it here, partnership working is good. Okay, look, I'm going to round this up now. Um, suffice to say that in January, uh, I'm the editor of the magazine and we, with other journalists and, and, and uh, Patricia here is guest editor. Every issue that we bring out, we, w the way we do it is when, when we have a theme, we approach someone who's steeped in that area and I will work with them as the editor of the magazine and then the magazine will evolve out of that. So the whole magazine will be looking in depth um, for roughly, take about three months to, to bring it all together and then to print it and publish it and put it online. And, and anyone here who has ideas, please contact us at viewdigital.org. Um, I'll be putting out appeals and asks, etc., for a range of stories. Um, but I'm delighted today to have had Patricia here today, Aidan and, uh, and Richard. Uh, is there anything that, that I haven't asked or I've been amiss? that you'd like to say as a final sort of a final few words before, before we finish. Tricia? I'd just like to say uh, thanks for being here. I'm going for quality, not quantity. So <laughs> <laughs> every time, thanks for listening. And that I, I do hope that if there is any, um, any ways that you can work with us, please get in touch because um, I do think it's a solvable issue. Aiden? Nothing much more to add. I, I mean, I just echo Patricia's thanks for people for, for sitting it out. I know it's, it's late in the day. Um, I was just thinking of my mate who works in uh, uh, BT, has worked in BT and telecoms for years. Uh, he's a software designer. I remember a conversation. I used to live in Belfast, quite close to where he lives. And I remember, probably people of a certain vintage remember going to rent videotapes out of ExtraVision. And like 25 years ago, I remember very clearly having a conversation with him and he was going, you know, in 10 or 15 years' time, you know, this place is going to be defunct. And I'm going, what are you talking about? People are always going to want to watch movies. And he's going, yeah, no, but you, it'll just stream down over the internet, over into your tally. And I was going, I write that on. You know, so for me, it's that idea of potential and what's in the future, what's next coming down the line. Um, but how do we include as many people as possible in it? I don't. There's a, there's a poem that I uh, like. I don't know if people have ever read it. It's Gray's Elegy in a Country Churchyard. It was, it was written in the 1700s, but it's basically someone working. The poet basically is, is wandering through a country churchyard looking at just the ordinary working people who are buried there and looking at all the headstones and m sort of musing on the lost potential of what those people could have been um, and what they could have achieved if they had had the opportunity. So these themes and these issues are probably as ancient as the Roman Empire, um, and it's something that we need to keep a focus on all the time. Thank you very much. And Richard, last but not least. Really just thank you for being here. Um, I just wanted to mention one last thing. Um, I have lots of thoughts, you know, about digital inclusion. Um, I mean, I'm an architect, and I really value, you know, the creativity. You know, I value, you know, my independence, you know, and, you know, the digital inclusion for everybody is like, it should be an equal. It shouldn't be, you know, we're not all like robots. It's, it's about, you know, for example, it's like Stephen Hawkins and the wheelchair, you know, so, I mean, everybody, he's famous, like a philosopher. So, I mean, his, his voice box that he had, 
you know, from, you know, you've heard it before, I mean, very, very, you know, robotic sound, you know, to give you the opportunity to do upgrade the voice boxes, you know, what it's going to be like, you know, in an airplane, you know, how, you know, your air hose. And he refused to all that there. But, you know, that was his identity. Um, you know, so digital inclusion, you know, whatever it means, you know, working for me as an architect, it's not going to be sold for everybody, but the process should be including everybody and all their thoughts should be included in that process. It's about respecting each other and respecting individuals. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And for everyone who came here today, and, and as I say, keep an eye out for, um, for the magazine coming out in the new year and the work will be around it. As I say, it's a three-month process and I'm looking forward to the journey. I, I call it the journey and see where we end up. But anyway, thank you very much to the panel and to yourselves for coming and staying. Thank you. <laughs>